Welcome to the Johnny Dell Football Academy podcast on the channel that's trying to answer the whys and hows of the game by talking through and dissecting game film and diving deeper to explain why the X is zig and the O zag. I am Adam Marino, joined by Mr. Johnny Dell, and we are reminding you, as always, the most fun way to watch is on YouTube, where we go live. There you can comment into the live show. Be sure to hit the notification bell and turn on your notifications so you can be a part of the conversation. We also stream live on Facebook and X. Also, the audio versions are always found on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, if you are live with us in the chat, it's probably because you are subscribed, you've hit the notification bell, and turned those notifications on. So, when sharing with your friends, be sure to let them know. We also love to hear from you outside of our live show. Email us at Johnny Dell's Football Academy at gmail.com, and you can always check out the website, jfa 49 Dot com, as it is the most fun way to support the channel. Also, the way we boost the chat and boost the algorithm is to type out hashtag JD49. Whew, man, it is Friday, April 12th, 2024. We are a little bit closer to not only the NFL draft, but the regular season. That's how excited I am for football in April. So thank you to (laughs) those uh, already in the algorithm for us. Colin, Technic Chick, thank you. Hashtag JD49 if you are with us. As we're going to go through um, some third-round picks, and Johnny and I were talking before the show that this was harder than it ever has been in doing these. If you have not seen some of the other shows, be sure to go back the last couple of weeks. We've had some fun going through just some nostalgia and going through our uh, first round picks, second round picks. And so today we're going through our third round picks. And I knew that this was going to be hard just off the jump. And I feel like it it kind of surprised you that you were having so much so much trouble. How'd you, how'd you do? Uh, yeah, it was, it was a little painful. Uh, I will say a uh, welcome to Colin. He looks like he's from across the pond there, uh, with hashtag UK. So he's, um, the colony, the former colonies say hello. Uh, but Colin, welcome in to the show. Yeah, it's, it was a lot harder. I, you know, I kind of just imagine because, you know, you remember a few of the really important names exactly of recent memory or you know 49ers lore of where they were drafted and then there was a couple guys that i forgot were drafted in the third round of where they were sure and uh and so it was a little it was very very difficult there's there's four really three guys on here that it physically hurts to (laughs) not put in the top five there's one guy that is tough but I'm like, yeah, you know, uh, I can deal with him not being on there. There's three guys that it is just physically, I'm not going to sleep well tonight. It, I'm just not. And well, they're still going to be on the uh, show, right? We're going to have our yeah. We'll we'll mention them, yeah. um, because you can't not mention them. But God, oh, man, it's it's difficult. It there. I mean, these are these are legends of the 49ers and i you know i i really say looking at this list you know as far as talent level the top nine out of the third round might overall talent wise be better than the top nine from the first round it's hard to say i mean that's wild to think about uh but the 49ers really hit on some on some third rounders over the years yeah, they uh, definitely have a few that I was like, man, I it's hard to believe that their talent was not seen until the third round. But, I mean, in some cases, um, you get it based on the school they went to and, and things like that. So do you want to start with some that did not make the cut? I'll start with one who didn't make the cut. Uh, 
and your, your cut. You know, they might have made. Yeah, mine. Didn't, make, didn't make didn't make my cut. I I doubt he made your cut. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll say this is this is most likely a, a pretty solid honorable mention, and that's Bill Romanowski. So, yep. uh, you know, he he didn't make my top five. Uh, part of it was that he only played six seasons in San Francisco and then he went and played six seasons with the Broncos and then a couple seasons with the Raiders and a couple seasons with the Eagles, uh, won two Super Bowls with the Broncos when he went and went over there with Mike Shanahan. When Mike Shanahan left, uh, to go to the Broncos, he went and, uh, and snagged Bill Romanowski from the 49ers over there with them. And they won a couple, couple Super Bowls there. He also won two Super Bowls with the 49ers was, a, was a key part of that starting defense. And, uh, it was a monster, uh, set a record up until that was, wasn't broken until 2006 for most consecutive games started. And with the way he played, that was really impressive. Yeah. It was like 256 straight games. Uh, you, you don't see anybody make it 256 games without missing a game anymore. So, uh, you know, Bill Romanowski, he was, he was quite the linebacker, quite the personality, um, on and off the field. Uh, you know, that's one way to put it, but, uh, Bill Romanowski, um, he's, he didn't quite make the cut, but honorable mention. Yeah, I definitely was looking at him and, uh, there was just too many names ahead of him. And I also, do get a little joy, I will admit, of leaving him off the list <laughs> because you simply cannot spit in my favorite team's face. Like, yeah, you, like you just I don't care. Like you just can't. So I don't have a I don't have a problem not having him on the list just out of sheer uh, Yeah. That's kind of what I mean. He was quite the personality on and off the field. <laughs> yeah. Um was not yeah. necessarily a guy that I think I'd want to uh, want to go hang out with, but you know, right. um, <laughs> he's he was quite the player. Yeah. So um, a guy that is not even honorable mention that I'd rather have because he didn't spit on people was actually Jeff <laughs> Ulbrich. Um, yeah. And not yeah, that Jeff he, Ulbrich he, was. Yeah. He he wasn't the player. He truly wasn't like. He, he was a, a fine NFL player, but was he even in our discussion for top, you know, draft picks of all time? Yeah. No, but just since you brought up Romanowski, I just simply wanted to say shout out to Jeff Ulbrich for never spitting on someone that we know of. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, Jeff Ulbrich, he was part of that defense with Derek Smith um, that the 49ers had that a, a good linebacker combo that they had there uh, in the early two thousands. And, um, and so, you know, that was, there, there were a couple guys that I think are underrated in the history of 49ers linebackers, both Derek Smith and, and Jeff Ulbrich and Ulbrich was the third rounder Derek and Smith, now yeah, is yeah. the, is the defensive coordinator for the jets. And yeah. was a guy that a lot of the number of fans were, Saying we're hoping that we would go get and you know, yeah. the problem there was you just can't get him in a lateral move. It's it's just mm -hmm. not possible. But yeah, a lot of people forget about Derek Smith too. He was released by Mike Nolan. I remember uh, we went and picked up uh, Takeo Spikes uh, after letting Derek Smith go. We had Patrick Willis. He had emerged, and I remember. And and again, this is just kind of puts you where Derek Smith was in the league that he was better than a lot of people. A lot of people remember because Tequila Spikes was a pretty good linebacker. And I remember Mike Nolan being asked why they let Tequila, why they signed Tequila Spikes and let Derek Smith go. He said, you know, they said, what what's the difference between the two players? And Mike Nolan went mm, about two million dollars, and uh, that Derek Smith came was about 2 million more expensive than Takeo Spikes was at the time. So uh, that kind of gives you an, an idea of how the, the league felt about them. But yeah, uh, Jeff Ulbrich, yeah, good name. Uh, he always reminds me of that, that Mooch uh, early yeah. 2000s era. Just a solid guy you want on your football team, but not to make our list. Uh, another guy for me that didn't uh, make the list, but I think is worth um, – bringing up as far as you talk about nostalgia not anyone in this chat i don't think will really 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 hardcore remember this name but the stats are just simply eye-popping um he went to um he went to high school 
uh, Polytechnic High School in San Francisco, played at University of San Francisco. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. They... you can't. No, no, no. I know where you're going. You can't drop this name yet. No, Why? he's not on my list. He's on mine. Well, what are we doing? Am I? Well, I'm just saying. We we gotta get we gotta start dropping through the top five. I'm I'm pretty sure you, I know who you're talking how, about. How are you leaving off guys then? You left off someone that shouldn't be left off then. I can already tell I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's tough. It's tough. Um okay, so then yeah, okay, we, we have a we have a we have a difference here. Cause so, I, I think I'm pretty sure I know who you're talking about. Unless there was two guys who ended up having that same sort of resume but no. let's just let's just get into this we'll we'll get we'll circle back around to the to the honorable mentions here once we get through let's five through, through, list through two yeah all right so give me your fifth best 49ers third round pick of all time my fifth is going to be um jeff albrick's number his same jersey number and so that's going to be navarro bowman yep at number five, um, just for sheer, sheer impact on the game with teaming up with Willis was just a really cool thing to be able to see for those years, whether it was one year or 10, the impact was is not arguable. And so for that reason, simply, I couldn't leave him out of the top five. And so he is at number five, Navarro Bowman. Yeah, from linebacker you. Um, I, I will say, so th this is part of why we do this. I, I think that's a great choice. I left Navarro Bowman off my list. What kind of a and fan it are physically you? Hurt. It physically hurt to leave Bo <laughs> off the list. Now, now here's why. Here, here was my reasoning. That there are four guys who are currently in the Hall of Fame that are that were drafted in the third round and there's one guy who will be a first ballot hall of famer and i just could not justify putting navarro bowman over that and then we have another third round th third rounder who by the time his career is done if he doesn't suffer the same kind of injury that navarro bowman did his accolades will be better than bowman's when when his career is all said and done so that's why I had to leave Navarro Bowman off my list, which really, really hurt. Uh, I mean, you're talking about a four-time All-Pro, three-time first-team All-Pro, and a three-time Pro Bowler, comeback player of the year. Uh, I mean, and, and you talk about Willis and Bowman, that is, without a doubt, the greatest linebacker duo the 49ers have ever had and maybe the league has ever had. That three-year run, from 2011, 12, and 13, the linebacker play was unreal. Yeah. It's maybe something the league will never see again. I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to describe how, and, and if you didn't see it, you know, those of us who watched it know exactly what we're talking about, that, that the linebacker play was just unreal. And, and that offense in 2011 for the 49ers was terrible. They <laughs> led the league in three and outs. And the defense <laughs> led the league in led the league in providing three and outs. I mean, that defense was so phenomenal. If you pair that defense with a, with a Kyle Shanahan offense, you've won four Super Bowls by, by now. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, those guys and what they did. Uh, so, you know, but again, he, and, and this isn't anything he did wrong. It was just the, the horrible unfortunateness of the NFL. Sometimes his career, I felt was just a little too short. And in the end, is Navarro Bowman ever going to end up in the Hall of Fame? I'm not so sure. I, I just, I, you know, w if Patrick Willis had the struggles that he had getting right. into the Hall of Fame, Navarro Bowman will never make it. Right. And so just kind of looking at the rest of this list, you know, that was the tipping point for me with him and, and a couple other guys. So that's where it was. Big shout out here uh, to Dre Area Sports. I was on his channel yesterday. Uh, we did. We had a great time. Uh, we ended up talking way longer than, than we thought we would. It was good. Uh, the vibe was there, and, and we had a great conversation. So you can go back, and, and I simulcasted on, on this channel. Uh, you can go back and check it out. Uh, we, had a, we had a great time. But, yeah, uh, man, it, I, and I will tell you, it physically hurt. I love Navarro Bowman as a player, as, as a person, like everything about him. I, I love Navarro Bowman. And so leaving him off this list was 
really tough. Fair, completely fair. Then who is your number five then? So my number five is another linebacker. Uh, he was drafted in 1964, three-time All-Pro, seven-time Pro Bowler, was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2000. His nickname was the Intimidator, and that is Dave Wilcox. So uh, that was my number four uh, best, or number sorry, number five best uh, third-round pick of all time. You know, those 49ers teams from the 60s into the early 70s are all often oftentimes forgotten. Uh, but they were a team that was always oh so close and were a big reason for, you know, the NFC championship game, the catch, why that was such a big deal was it was the 49ers finally getting over the hump and beating Dallas who had beat them in the seventies. And so, yeah, Dave Wilcox, great linebacker, uh, really, uh, brought, and, you know, kind of, kind of what Navarro Bowman did when he came in and Patrick Willis brought an athleticism to the, to the position that wasn't necessarily really common, had 14 interceptions in his career. Uh, that's pretty darn good for a linebacker, especially, you know, and you look at some of the numbers that their defense allowed. It's, it was pretty incredible. I mean, they, they had one playoff game, I, I believe it was against the Vikings where they didn't allow over a hundred yards passing or rushing. Like the, the, they allowed, it was like 99 yards rushing and 93 net yards passing. I mean, that's incredible to, to do that. Uh, I don't care what era of football you're in. That's pretty incredible. So, uh, you know, Dave Wilcox, he's in the 49ers ring of honor uh, there at the stadium. So, yeah, they're, they're, that he was my fifth best uh, third round pick of all time. And that's fair. He was on my list of um, people to, to talk through for absolutely at 6'3", He was your honor. He was an honorable mention. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah, and that's that's the hard thing. So, I mean, when you look at like Dave Wilcox and Navarro Bowman next to each other, you're looking at, you know, Navarro Bowman, four time all pro Dave Wilcox, three time all pro Navarro Bowman, three time pro bowler, Dave Wilcox, seven time pro bowler. The difference for me was, again, is one guy when you look at the history of the game and what he did at the position at the time he played and Dave Wilcox, what he did that he's in the hall of fame. And there, there's a reason why Navarro Bowman. I just don't see him being hall of fame worthy. And so I, how can I put somebody who I wouldn't put in the hall of fame ahead of a guy who I would. And and that's where it, where it came down to for me. Right. Yeah. That's totally fair. Um, uh, 1% agree to disagree. <laughs> But, but I see like where I said, you're coming like from. I said, this was tough. This was yeah, hard, yeah. man. It definitely was. Um, okay, so um, where are we at? What number four number for four. me? Number four. Yeah, number four for you. Who is your fourth best third round pick of all time? So I was going to just take out a um, Sharpie from my sock. Oh, and, oh, boy. And ride it across. So I think we know. Um, that I prefaced that earlier when I said it's hard to believe that some of these guys went in the third round, except for the fact that when you look at the colleges that they went to. And so when and I think T.O. kind of was a guy that went through that. Terrell Owens, for those who don't remember the 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 Monday night football game. Oh, no one doesn't remember. Come on top. now, Johnny. No Sometimes. One some, no, hey, look, look, no. maybe there's some people who become fans of the of the game over the last 10 years. This was 20 years ago, Adam. <laughs> remember, this was 20 years ago. So uh, not you know, buying it. I'm still not buying it. These people technician there, says you might need to bust out your popcorn. Yeah, you just, yeah. You better have your popcorn this, ready. This <laughs> is this is the channel that answers the whys and hows of the game. This is for the hardcore fan who knows Terrell Owens. We Football do not need to speak. Uh, you know, yes. So I am uh, adhering to the, I am respecting the chat, you know, and, um, but anyway, I, I do think um, that he did not do everything in his career um, exactly the right way, nor did he catch all of his touchdowns with us. But boy, I am sure glad that he was on our team. And just the moment, I I'm more of an emotional guy that when I look back and see him sobbing his eyeballs out of his head to Steve Mariucci 
after dropping all of those passes and just catching that football and then breaking the record on a, what should be a national holiday, Jerry Rice Day, he happens to break the record for most catches in a game while wearing a 49ers uniform. Like, to me, those are things that are just so special to me. Yeah, it was like 20 catches in a game. I mean, it was just bananas. And it was on Jerry Rice's final home game. Yeah, it's like, geez, dude. It was Jerry Rice Day. Well, yeah. and, and look, M Mooch, you know, and Terrell Owens have both talked about this, that uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember who they were playing. but the Bears. The, the, the Bears, yeah. The Bears kept rolling a safety over the top of Jerry the whole game. And yeah, so they knew because th they were like, this is this is Jerry Rice Day. Yeah, they're going to try and get him the ball. We're not, having it. We're not going to let that happen. And so, you know, poor uh, Jeff Garcia sitting there. He had to, he, you know, the, the reads told him every time go to Terrell Owens. And so that's why Terrell <laughs> gets, you know, breaks the record on Jerry Rice Day. And, and they've given Mooch flack for that. Ever since then, like you, you yeah. gave the ball to Theo twenty times on Jerry Rice Day. <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, I mean Terrell Owens. Uh, we'll, I'll talk about him a little bit more, maybe, maybe a little bit later. I, yep, I may yep. have have him on a different spot on my list, but yeah, Terrell Owens. It's hard. It, it is hard to believe that he was a third round pick, especially you know when, how he burst onto the scene with the 49ers. Yeah, yeah. But coming out of where Tennessee Chattanooga, that's just how how it goes for sure. Um, yeah. Shows you how good Jerry Rice was to be at Mississippi Valley State and for Bill Walsh to be like, huh, and to find him on accident. Yeah, to find him on accident and be like, mm -hmm. oh, whoa, I need to get him. That just I mean, speaks to what Jerry Rice is. But yeah, Jerry, Jerry Rice grew up about an hour or so from where I live, and it is a tiny little town. I mean, Starksville. You, and, and yeah, and I mean, like you you have to go out of your way to get there too. Like, and there's <laughs> nothing there other than like a sign that's like home of Jerry Rice. And that's right. it. There's like, nothing but there's bricks. Nothing, there. nothing but bricks. Some of <laughs> no, you will know that reference. There. Like, like <laughs> he, his dad actually did a lot of work, not in their town. It was everywhere around there. Cause like, it's not that far from some bigger towns there in Mississippi, but uh, you know, it was, he had to serve everything around there. It wasn't even sure. in his town, but um. But here and here's why I had to stop you earlier is my number four overall best third round pick of all time is a tackle that was drafted in 1953. He went to San Francisco Polytechnic High School right across from Kizar Stadium. They played their high school games at Kizar. And then he went to San Francisco University, the University of San Francisco, played all of his home games at Kizar there. Uh, then ended up going to Tulsa for one season, and that was the only season he didn't play his home games in San Fr at Kizar Stadium. And that is a six foot nine tackle out of Tulsa, Bob St. Clair. And uh, he was a five time second team All Pro, five time All Pro, five time Pro Bowler. And in 1990, was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And the field at Kizar, there is now the Bob St. Clair Field. Uh, so, you know, they renamed it after him. He's a 49ers legend in every way. Uh, also blocked 19 punts in his career. Or, excuse me, 19 field goals. 19 field goals because he was six foot nine. Yeah. He brought, you know, that's that's ridiculously <laughs> tall. get 20. <laughs> like, I mean, Trent Williams, for, for how big he is, is six foot three. Eric Armstead and DeForest Buckner, known as the trees, you know, as the guys that were just massive. They're six foot six. He was three inches taller than them. Uh, so uh, Bob St. Clair there at tackle in in the in the fifties. He was it was uh, drafted then. He's my number four best third round pick of all time, and I believe he was on your honorable mentions. You have to justify to me why he's an honorable mention and not on your top five. Because wait till you see the three names I have. <laughs> wait, I mean, wait till you see my next three. There, I mean, I'm not leaving them off. I mean, that's really the only reason. That's what that's where I had though. But look, this is a this is a man who was is in the Hall of Fame, has been in the Hall of Fame for 34 years, and you're leaving him off your list. How mm. many how many Super Bowls did he win? Okay, okay. 
uh, that's our only metrics of success. And no, Patrick Willis should not I never be in the said, Hall of Fame. I never said only metric, but I was just asking a question. So because wait, it, you know, wait justify, till... justify to me why Bob St. Clair is off your list and Navarro Bowman is on. Because I will say. Without being able to see, I love Navarro because I watched him play. Right. I mean, that was 51% of it. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll fully admit that this is, this is, this isn't 49ers.com show. This is the Johnny Doe football <laughs> Academy podcast, which I co-host. <laughs> so this is, okay. <laughs> it's, you know, this isn't for 49ers.com. This isn't going to be on their, on their website. It, it, however, it should. This isn't, this isn't just chilling for right. the Ring of Honor, right? That's what he's saying. <laughs> right, right. Like this and, is what we their, get. This their, is why we talk about it. This is, you know, yeah, you know, it's it's not just shilling for you know that they have a statue of Bob St. Clair uh, there at the field. Uh, you know, I think there's somebody else on the on your list that doesn't have that yet. I'm just gonna say that, Adam. But you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Um. All right, so All right. Our, we're at number three for me, right? We're at number three. Well, who is your third best? Well, it's a guy that has some Super Bowls, and he caught a pretty in, <laughs> he caught a pretty important touchdown on a drive in which it started by the quarterback pointing out that John Candy is eighty yards away, <laughs> trying to just keep everyone calm. And so, um, oh gosh, now here's a guy I love. <laughs> I love doing these shows because the chat watches all of them and they pick up on things <laughs> this uh technic chicks has been watching some of these draft picks of all-time bids notice that johnny now, says, here's a guy this man's a little bit yeah reminds me of chris collinsworth <laughs> that's a drinking game for a lot of people in in america that whenever chris collinsworth does that you have to take a shot and then they call off now the here's a guy because <laughs> they just they can't work the next day they're hung over <laughs> yeah now so, here's a guy who you know he's he's just he's he's able to just run down the field. He's a phenomenal player. That's and my the, best. That's my best. This guy is yeah yeah. Uh, and Doctor Steve bringing it too says not everyone knows as much about World War II tanks or players from fifty years ago. <laughs> so I'm just saying. So I'm, I'm just saying. Do. Hey, very few people have that intersectional moment. Of, not everyone of, of stuff. <laughs> I got my World War II tank sitting right here on the other side of the desk for me. Yeah, and I can uh, I can show my phone and show you text messages of pictures. We don't of, need to do that, trip. Adam. We don't <laughs> need to go down that road, Adam. All right, all right. Let's speaking of road, let's go down our our finish our road here. We are on number three for me, and I have pretty much a hundred percent given it away that it is uh, number eighty two on your scorecard. Number one in your hot is uh, John Taylor. And that's all I got. There's nothing else to say. Adam, how much are you going to hate me if I say he's on my honorable mentions list? I look, I will tell you that I there here's what I'm going to say real quick. There's an argument to be made that if John Taylor was on another team that his numbers would be, you know, all 49er fans say, "Oh, Jonathan John Taylor, he would have been a number 1 for 25 other teams." And and I'm willing to admit that maybe that is not the case i'm willing to admit that however the man still was the number two on a like on a mind-boggling team like there are yeah. fans of the jacksonville jaguars of the new york giants of whatever who just look at those teams and they're like oh, must be nice to have a team that did that and john taylor was on that team guys and he was very like he was incredibly John intricate. Taylor was a very, very talented player. He, now, now this is a person who I'm not going to say this is a man. So this is a person <laughs> who, you know, okay. cause I, I got, just got roasted for that. Yeah, so th this did. is a player. This is a player who, uh, with Jerry Rice on the team with Dwight Clark on the team was still as productive with Roger Craig getting, a hundred targets a year. Uh, it was was still a very productive receiver. Now he's on my honorable honorable mentions, and it's it's hard to put a guy who is part of such a legendary moment in 49ers history 
and has won Super Bowls with the team, multiple Super Bowls with the team, to put him, you know, not as a, a top five. And this is what I mean. Like, it was painful with so many of these players. Here's why. In all those seasons, playing with, with San Francisco, he had two 1,000-yard seasons. He didn't have a single season where he had more than 65 catches. And I get it. He's playing with Jerry Rice. But that is the facts that I'm looking at that. And then again, some of the things that these other guys have done, I just couldn't put John Taylor on that list. So John Taylor's on my honorable mentions. And and seeing, I'm thinking, you didn't put Dave Wilcox or Bob St. Clair on your list. So we got issues there, Adam. Um because you got these two guys on there that are on my honorable mentions, and you have those two guys. As, you have Hall of Fame players as as honorable mentions over these guys. But yeah, John Taylor. I mean, he was a great player. Uh, and like you said, if if he's on another team that's a, another you know passing attack team, he probably has a lot better numbers than he does. But again, there's only so many targets to go around, especially in that era. And, uh, and so, yeah, John Taylor, great player, uh, will always re- be cemented in 49ers lore for catching that football in the back of the end zone, which was designed to go to him. And it was because, you know, they knew that Jerry was going to get the double team on that cover two, uh, in, in the end zone that John Taylor was going to be open on the post. So yeah, uh, good, good, good pick there. But, Number three, that seems a little high for John Taylor. So my number three of all time is another wide receiver. And it's one that you already mentioned, so we won't go into it too much, but that is Terrell Owens. Um, Just a reminder, you know, Terrell Owens, he was kept out of the Hall of Fame mainly because of him being Terrell Owens and all the drama that he he has been and he's created everywhere he's gone. But we're talking about the, the guy who has the third most receiving yards career in NFL history. You know, that that's that's wild. It's Jerry Rice, Randy Moss, Terrell Owens. Uh I mean that that's where it is. And so um you know what what he did and and his impact on the game will always be remembered. He, he's quite the personality. Again, on and off the field, I'll always remember uh the reports that of when he he was having his issues there with Je- with uh Jeff Garcia uh, of him and Jeff Garcia called him a, a a cancer to the team and or a virus to the team that he showed he walked out to practice wearing a surgical mask over his helmet um it's cuz he didn't want to infect anybody else in it you know that that's who that's who TO was uh and so um you know always remember that and and the catch to Again, you know, just like John Taylor in the back of the end zone, one of the, one of the greatest memories as a 49ers uh, fan. And for me, that was probably the greatest memory I have because I was I was just into my teen years during that time. And uh, and and so really, really cementing a, a pivotal moment, you know, that playoff moment uh, has been is, is so huge. You know, maybe it'll go down like the 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 butterfly catch with Ayuk. I'm not calling it the fluke to Ayuk. It's not a fluke. It was the butterfly catch. That's what that's what I'm calling it last year. You know, that should go down in in the annals of 49ers history. Yeah, <laughs> I'm down. I'm down with that. Uh, hello. All right. To your I'm pretty wife. sure. Yeah, my lovely wife is in the chat. Hey, baby. Um, so I th- oh. I think our, I'm pretty sure our, our top two are going to be the same, though. I'm pretty sure. If they aren't, we're going to have some issues here. So uh, we're, we need to we'll, – we'll, we'll maybe, you know, sidebar here. Who's yeah, I, left on your honorable mentions? Yeah, so I was going to say Guy McIntyre. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I think was just a solid football player and just worth... well, he, he was more than a solid football player. He was a really good football player. I mean, fair. I you know, I, he's not ladybug in... catch. Sorry, not butterfly catch. Ladybug catch. I get, the chat always, always, always corrects me. It's amazing. You guys are awesome. Uh, oh yeah, I said ladybug. butterfly. I meant ladybug. You know, because he talked about the ladybug landed on his shoe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say that he. It, it's tough to even put him in at the top 10 maybe like guy McIntyre. Well, maybe he could be number nine. 
I, you know, I'm just saying, like, yes, he was well, really good. He was a guy who, for the 49ers, five now, here's a guy. <laughs> five time Pro Bowler, one time All Pro, three time Super Bowl champ. You said that earlier. That was a, a prerequis- prerequisite. I I could actually make an argument of Guy McIntyre being higher on the list than John Taylor, but uh, he's he's. I'm really struggling to saying he's a guy, um, but <laughs> Guy McIntyre, especially when his name's Guy. I mean, come on. He is literally a guy, but he was also the innovator of using a lineman as a blocking back. If you remember, which I mean, I don't remember. I, I read about it and <laughs> went back and watched it because I was born this year. But in 1984, in the playoffs, Bill Walsh uh, put Guy McIntyre in his in, at fullback in goal line situations to bowl over the Bears. They were playing the Bears in the playoffs, and they did that. And that that miffed uh, that miffed Mike Ditka so much that he turned around the next year and put the fridge as his blocking back in short yarded situations. <laughs> and everybody and everybody you know because everybody remembers the fridge as as that blocking back and like, Oh, that was bears football, you know, the bears and, 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 you know, their physical smash mouth style of doing that. And it fit with what they did Walter Payton, but they forget that he took that from bill Walsh and using guy McIntyre as that. So that was the innovator of that, that thing, which then, you know, teams still do today. The lions, they're doing that now. Dan Campbell is, is sometimes putting a, a 340 pound lineman as a fullback in there to block and on short yardage situations. And so guy McIntyre was the, the innovator of that with bill Walsh. So in some ways I can make the argument that guy McIntyre should be higher on the list of John Taylor. And he is for me, uh, he was, he was another guy. I was really struggling into that fifth spot again, five time pro bowl or one time all pro. And, uh, and when you look at, you know, if you, if you replace John Taylor with somebody else who was a really good player, you probably still win those Super Bowls, right? Um, if you replace Guy McIntyre with another guy, with just a guy, that's a big that's a big difference. You know that offensive line for the 49ers, again was was really key to them being able to do what they did. And so, you know, Guy McIntyre, uh, great guard, and uh, and so yeah, he he was on my honorable mentions, but it was tough. It was tough. Who yeah. else you got on the honorable mentions? Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. We we talked about Jeff Ulbrich. Um, trying to think. I think that was all. No, no. There's got to be another one here. The the Frediter. The Frediter has to be on your honorable mentions list, at least. Well. Okay, I guess in in some ways I was like guys who are like if they were to stop their career right this second, where would they be? And from and, before, and and we, you wouldn't have Fred Warner on your on your honorable mentions list at least. I, I mean, I I I would, but I guess current. We, we talked about that before on another show, and we were like, well, because he's still playing, it was like... Well, but he yeah, hasn't achieved I, everything. But even even if Fred Warner stopped his career... And remember, Fred Warner has played as many seasons as Navarro Bowman had. So, you know, like his career... Like, we think he his, his career is still really, really young, which it still is. But um, if you think about Fred Warner, like, he is... He's he's been in the league for a number of years now, and we're yeah. talking three time All Pro, three time Pro Bowler, and has was in the running this year, and and prob- probably should have gotten Defensive Player of the Year this season. Uh, is in that conversation each year, which again is is not common. Navarro Bowman was was one of the you know it was a linebacker when he was playing. He was in that conversation for Defensive Player of the Year. You know when when I look at his career at this point, where it is and Navarro Bowman's career, uh, I would say Fred's done about everything that Navarro did. Um, he's 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 a different, a little bit different style of a player, but absolutely dynamic. And if if he ended his career today, 
that you would still have an argument for him, you know, being on this is now again, if he plays another three years, he's cracking the top five. Uh, yeah. I'm going to put him over in there over Dave Wilcox. Yeah. I think he plays another fair. three years at the, at the, the rate he's playing. He's a hall of, he's a hall of first ballot hall of famer. He should be uh, now without, if he stopped his career today, he would be, you know, kind of 49ers hall of fame ring of honor type of guy. But yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, he has to be considered in, in these, in this list. If we're going to consider Bill Romanowski as a, as an honorable mention or, you know, Dave Wilcox, I think Fred Warner by this point in his career has done a lot of things that they've done. He's all pro Fred. I mean, uh, there, there's a, there's thing there. So I have Navarro or Fred, Fred Warner on my honorable mentions. Shame on you for not having him on your honorable mentions, Adam. (laughs) I mean, technically, yes, of course he is. I was looking at players who are okay, okay. retired. Is all okay, I'm okay. But yes. But didn't you have Debo Samuel on your honorable mentions as a second rounder? And that's what I'm saying is because you gave me crap, then I then so I stopped. <laughs> I stopped. No, looking. I agree. Debo Samuel was, on, was an honorable mention on my second rounders. <laughs> but I'm all just, I'm saying okay. is. That discussion. All right, we better me. we better get this back to the back on the rails. We're all right. Let's get back on the rails here. I'm pretty sure our number two is going to be the same. Yeah. So who who's going to announce this? Me or you? So I'll announce number one or sorry number two and and talk a little bit about him and I'll and I'll let you take number one and talk a little bit about him. So um, at number two, <clears throat> um, Frank Gore and and what he's, Frank the Tank? Yeah, what he did. Um, first of all, just if his career was exactly cut in half be, due to the injuries, it would still be a phenomenal career where you would look back yeah. and say, wow, it's so cool that he was able to do that. But now you have to take into account, wait a minute, that's fantasy land. He actually did double what we're just talking about. He did play the whole career and all that and all the rushing yards and and just what he meant for the 49ers all those years, you feel so bad that he was born when he was born because of, of the struggling years that we had where it's like he and Joe Staley deserved more and will yeah. always be grateful to those two guys in particular, um, a number of others for sure. But it's just like, man, Frank the Tank, like it's there's no argument. Not one person will argue that. And so I'm just here to say thank you, Frank Gore, for everything you did for the league and for the 49ers. Yeah, I mean, ab- absolutely. Frank Gore, uh, you want to talk about consummate pro, a guy who came in, you know, had, had was coming off those. And the reason why he was a third round pick coming off those horrible knee injuries he yeah. had in college. And, and the concern was he won't be able to be durable. That was that was the thing that everybody said about him coming out of college. And at the time, if you remember, the 49ers had a thousand yard running back on the roster that was supposed to be their number one back. And he's actually a guy I have in my kind of uh, disappointments. I won't say worst third round picks. I'll say more disappointments as far as guys that I thought we we thought was, was going to be better than they were. Kevon Barlow. Ke- yeah, Kevon Barlow. Kevon, whatever. Uh, yeah, he, it was. It was it, most spelled. people would say Kevin, and and I remember. Yeah, it was. It was spelled kind of like Kevin, a weird spelling of Kevin. And I remember there was like a Monday night football game. He was getting really irritated. He was like, "It's Kevon." Um, that uh, it was Kevon Barlow, who again was a thousand yard rusher for the 49ers, who was a guy that, I mean, when you talk about athleticism, we'll I'll talk about Kevin Barlow in a Kevon Barlow in a second, but sure. Sure. He was on the team. He was supposed to be the number one back when they drafted Frank Gore. And so Frank Gore was drafted to be a number two back, uh, that, that they needed. They wanted that one, two punch. And so bar, uh, Frank Gore was brought in and he did not start any, all but one game of his rookie year. You know, that's wild to think about of who he became and did not. And he started one game and that was because of injury uh, that he started one game. He had 600 yards rushing. But what they noticed is he was having a whopping 4.8 yards per attempt every time they handed him the ball. And so they're like, you know, what? we got to keep giving this kid Frank Gore some some touches. The next season, that 2006 season is still 
and and maybe will always be the greatest season from a 49ers running back as far as running the ball that we have ever seen. 1,695 yards rushing. What's wild is he was still third in the NFL that year. <laughs> I mean, that's what's wild. That was not the rushing uh, title that year. But 1,695 yards, 5.4 yards per carry. That's wild, that, <laughs> especially on that team. That offense was so bad. You know, Alex Smith was, that was the year that, you know, Alex Smith kind of, they thought, okay, you know, there were some good things, but Alex Smith only threw for like 3,000 yards that year. And, you know, it, it wasn't like they had this super dynamic offense. Now, Norv Turner was the offensive coordinator, if you remember. Uh, and we had Larry Allen, you know, the, the, the massive man that we brought over at the end of his career from Dallas that, was there opening holes, but 5.4 yards per carry is wild. And he did that in his second year. And, and you just look at, you know, he was the guy that they could, again, there I did it. Uh, he was, he was somebody who they could put the load on every single year. And like you said, all those bad years, the only year that he didn't get a thousand yards rushing in his first, like 10 years in the league was 2010. And just cause he only played 11 games, but, you know, and he still had 850 yards is is wild. Like he he would have been he was on pace to go over 1100 yards if he plays the entire season. Uh, so, you know, Frank Gore, just absolutely phenomenal in 2016. Again, his 11th, really his 12th season playing in the league. He still has a thousand yards. I mean, that's just bananas. 2017, he was 40 yards shy. He had 961 yards rushing. I mean, just the guy that that was so good and was so uh, reliable and consistent. And, I mean, the, the career, he's third in career rushing yards NFL ever. You know, this he will be yeah. in the Hall of – he's only not in the Hall of Fame right now because he is not eligible until next year. Right. And that's wild to think about, that a running back drafted in 2005 is not eligible for the Hall of Fame until 2025. Yeah. A that's... running back. I mean, the, with the mileage these guys have. Uh, so Frank Gore, one of, one of the, I mean, when you talk about favorite 49ers of all time, he was, he was somebody who never complained. He never, you never saw him whining about more touches. He just showed up each year, carried the team literally. And I will always remember one of my favorite runs from him was against the Rams. We were terrible that year. Uh, but it, it was, it was, I want to say a fourth down and we we're going for it. It was like fourth and two, and he ran it up the middle, bowled over a guy, and then ran 40-some yards for a touchdown and won the game. Um, love Frank Gore. I still have his jersey. It, it was he, it was the second jersey I ever owned as, as a fan. Uh, some friends of mine who were actually Seahawks fans, but they knew I was a 49ers fan for my birthday. They bought me a Frank Gore jersey. And, uh, and so, you know, when playoffs come around, I, I still throw the, the Frank Gore jersey on every once in a while. Uh, and, and it's the, the cardinal red ones, you know, not the cherry red um, jerseys, you know, it's from the, the late 2000s. So, um, you know, Frank Gore, love, love, love Frank Gore. Yep. I, same thing. My jersey was the white um, with that cardinal red that I didn't I didn't care for those color scheme changes that they did. And I was happy when they well, when your color is cardinal red and you're in a division with a team called the Cardinals. I mean. It's a little rough. Yeah. <laughs> and we yeah. were a little rough. The yeah. marketing the marketing team didn't fully think that one through. Yeah. So uh, now that leads us to number one. Number one third round pick of all time. Uh, and and that is Salim Rashid. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's Joe Montana, uh, quarterback out of Notre Dame. Everybody always forgets that, you know, you know, Rudy Rudiger that they played together at Notre Dame. Uh, you know, the movie came out and everyone was like, oh, wow. You know, there was, yeah, there was a few players there at Notre Dame. Uh, <laughs> and they forget that Joe Montana, you know, was the quarterback when the movie came out that, that Joe Montana was actually that quarterback. So, uh, but Joe Montana there. Yeah, he I was mean, the sixth the, string to start. <laughs> yeah. Joe Montana, the legend. I mean, th this is a guy. Uh, there it was. Dadgummit. Um that Joe Montana, great in in my opinion, greatest quarterback of all time. You know, I I can I can understand the argument for Tom Brady. 
it's totally a homer take to say Joe Montana, you know, when you have Tom sitting there with seven Super Bowls and all those things and everything. Hey, he's he did from now. the Bay Area. He's from the Bay Area. He's from the Bay Area, but I'm okay. You know, Joe Montana is the 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 chicken soup game. You know, back at Notre Dame to coming to the 49ers again as a third round pick. He was he was not brought in as the absolute starter. The 49ers had a starter, Steve DeBerg. You remember right? that. Yeah, it was DeBerg, was who was a big arm guy, athletic yeah, guy, a good who could throw the ball a mile. You know, this it really reminds you of, you know, Trey Lance and Brock Purdy. That Trey Lance is the big arm guy. He's a, he's got all the measurables. That was DeBerg. He he had the rocket arm, and everything. And, I'm, and Joe Montana, if you haven't watched the the series on Joe Montana, uh, yes. I believe it's on Hulu uh, or Peacock. I, know, I can't man. remember which one, but but I watched. It is absolutely phenomenal. So and good. and Montana talked about that that Deberg was there and he's and he said you know Steve was was great with me but you know man he could throw a ball a lot a lot better than I could um, <laughs> you know he talked about that and then that's what was there but he didn't run Bill Walsh's offense like Joe did and what Joe was able to do with that team and then the magic that was created and and the legendary stuff over the years. Uh, and and it just it makes you wish you know if Joe had played in today's league, with the rules that protect quarterbacks like they do now. I mean, Joe was just absolutely clobbered year after year. I mean, some some of the most brutal hits in NFL history, uh, especially to quarterbacks, were were you know Joe Montana took those, uh, and and obviously you know the the big one that kind of sent him. Sent his career, ended his career in San Francisco there. Uh, you know, but Joe Montana, his accolades stand for themselves. Obviously, best There's third nothing, round pick the 49ers ever had. Yeah. I mean, we we could have selected him uh first overall, and it would he would still be like our best pick ever. I mean, pretty much. It's just tough to say the things that he was able to do and just the stories from you brought up the documentary. My favorite story was that he would go down to the sideline and take a look at the phone and say, Oh, wouldn't it be funny if it dialed out? And so oh, I picked it up and sure enough, there's a dial tone. So, you know what? I called my house cause you know, I missed my wife. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah he I mean, call her. Guy, cause, cause they had the phones to talk up to the booth. Right. And it was just like, you know, and a lot of places back in the day when you go there, you'd pick up a phone and it had the internal uh, phone system. And if you press nine, it would get you an outside line. And uh, and then you could call out. So you had to press nine and then put in the phone number. And he was sitting there going, I wonder if I wonder if this guy's an outside line. And he hit nine. And he was like, sure enough, there was a dial there. tone. And so he called his house. He's like, I'm, I'm going to call my house. And his wife answered and she was she was confused. She's like, hey. And he yeah. was like, hey, honey. She's like what are you doing? Where are you calling me from? He goes, I'm on the sideline. Just wanted to call and say hi. <laughs> She's like, I'm what I was watching you on the TV. What, what's yeah. what's happening here? That was just who Joe was. I mean, yeah. uh, man, this guy that was just kind of, eh, we're here. We're playing a game. It's pretty fun. Let's keep right. doing this. And again, we talked about in the Super Bowl, like you love seeing on, on NFL network, they have, um, you know, I'll admit I enjoy watching even the other team stories, like stories on Bruce Smith or whatever. And they have always those championship teams from the nine, the the eighties and nineties, where we talked about Keena Turner always being someone that's interviewed, or uh, you know, Bart, or you know, or whatever. And these guys tell these stories of the first time I heard it, I was just blown away that he, they're in the huddle and it's two minutes left for them to win a Super Bowl and Joe Montana in the huddle says, Hey guys, look over there in the end zone. I think that's John Candy and Harris Barton. And he's like, line, Hey, look, Randy, like that, that's, like, that's, John, Hey, that's Sean Candy. And they're like, what? And they're like, Oh yeah, I think so. And it just had a calming, the sense of calm in that huddle was like no other, which obviously is pretty believable because not just any team could go down there in the Super Bowl and have that drive that they did. But just that story is just so like you talk about Joe cool and it's like Joe Burrow. Sorry, and, man, you got a long way to go before you can be called. Joe yeah. Cool. And and that was what was so amazing about Joe is that, you know, he could have a terrible game for three quarters <laughs> and 
I mean, just terrible. When you look at that NFC Championship game, the, the catch, he threw three picks in that game. Nobody remembers the three picks. They remember right. the catch. You know, they absolutely those those things like he could have a mediocre, okay, or bad game, and it didn't matter because eh, meh, it's all right. I'll throw a touchdown pass here, and and he would just do it. And and you know, that's the kind of stuff that what you see from Brock Purdy. What when people say it reminds you of Joe Montana is just the way he carries himself. Of like, this is a guy that doesn't get rattled. He doesn't get. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't sit there and and lose it and start playing really tight. You know, he just he plays who he is, and you know what? If when when things pretty cool things happen, he's like, oh, that was pretty cool. You know, whatever. Uh, and that's the way Joe was. He's like, oh, that was pretty. That was all right. All right, cool. Um, that they're really even keel guys, and and you know when you look at them physically, very similar. They're 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 just nothing there that jumps out at you that says, okay, this this guy is you know he can throw the ball a mile. Joe did not have a big arm. That was again why one. Re- he he had all those accolades he had in in college. He won a national championship and was drafted in the third round. There was a lot of quarterbacks drafted ahead of him, and he wasn't drafted you know at, to a team that needed a starter at that point because he was eh, a little small, little little frail considered. Couldn't really throw the ball real real far. Didn't have a lot of zip on the ball, and you know that's what we heard about Brock Purdy. And so uh, hopefully hopefully his career trajectory stays about stays pretty similar to. To Joe's, I, I want to talk about a few. I would say letdowns. You know, again, if you're not hitting on a third rounder, that's not going to kill you. So I, I, I want you know, it's not quite like the first and second rounders that right, really, right, right. you know, if there's guys that the big expectations and they just don't live up to it, and there's a lot of guys who didn't work out. But I, I was kind of walking through, and and these are more guys really out of the last twenty years because. That's when I, I watched more of the drafts from the 49ers. I was following the team about who they drafted and following some different players. So, and, and, and I kind of liked walking down uh, you know history lane for some of the busts of first rounders over the years and second rounders over the years. And so we're going to do that a little bit with third rounders. I'm going to talk about some guys that were letdowns. And uh, we talked about him a little bit before, Kevon Barlow. He was a guy that, to, for me, was a little bit of a letdown in, in that, he had a couple good years for the 49ers. I remember, uh, you know, him and Garrison Hurst with the Mooch teams and, Mm -hmm. and Barlow. I remember there was one, one game, I think it was Monday night football where bar, they handed the ball off to Barlow and he, there was a guy, a linebacker had come through right in the hole and he just gave a quick jab step, totally juked the guy out of his socks, took a step to his right and ran for a 72 yard touchdown. (laughs) I, I, why I remember that one, I, but he was, remember this was, he was 230 pounds when he played, he was like six foot two, 230 pounds. He was really big for a, a running back considered too tall for a lot of running backs. And at that size to move, like he did, I remember looking up his high school numbers when, uh, he was with the team and his senior year, he rushed for 3000 yards. I mean, that was just insane. Yeah. Um, the, it was just like his his high school career was unreal. Uh, and and you look at, you know, him coming out that he was he was supposed to be this big physical running back with four, four speed. And uh, and and him as a one, two punch with Garrison Hurst was great. And that's why they let Garrison Hurst walk is that the four ers were dealing with those salary cap issues. And they thought Barlow is, is a guy he'd run for a thousand yards when he wasn't the you know the sole feature back they're thinking this is going to be a 15 1600 yard rusher and didn't work out that's why i felt like barlow was a little bit of a letdown i think physically he had all the tools to be one of the best running backs in the league and it never really worked out so uh that that was that he was a letdown for me another guy was salim rashid i don't know if you remember salim rashid linebacker i remember there was so much buzz coming out of training camp about him because he had brought speed to the linebacker position it was like him and then and and he he flashed big time in preseason, and then I, I think he had some injuries, and then never really came around. And and I remember Jamie Winborn came in and kind of took that spot from him. But I remember the 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 buzz that was there about Salim Rashid that just never panned out. Do you remember him at all? I do. I do remember. Um, I don't remember exactly like what had happened. The way that I remember, like guys like Mike Rumpf and, and guys like that. But I do remember the name, but yeah. 
and Last another guy I that I, I think is um, very similar to a player we have right now, and that's Jason Hill. Uh, do you remember Jason Hill, wide receiver? Yep. He was drafted, and uh, and he was drafted in the in the 2007 season. That was when Jim Hostler was our offensive coordinator, and he was he was a big time speed guy. Was was seen as being just a you know that stretch the field, take the top off the defense, speed guy. Came on the team. There's all this buzz, and never did anything. I remember Mike Nolan one time being asked, and you know, because that 2007 offense was so bad, so bad, like epically bad. They were bad by a mile. Uh, wasn't even close. And I remember Mike Nolan getting really irritated in in one of the press conferences because you know I believe it was Matt Mayoko was was asking about, um, you know, are, are you are is this offense going to be able to do anything? You're going to be changing anything to try and create more explosiveness and more uh, production on offense. And he was in, he was like, what are we, what are we supposed to change here? You know, we, we have the players that we have in the building. And so we can't really change that right now at this point in the season. And he said, he goes, you know, is there some weapon out there that, that we have that I don't know about? And somebody said, well, what about Jason Hill? And he said, what about Jason Hill? You know, because he he was a rookie that year, had been drafted, had all that speed, and was supposed to be uh, a big a big offensive weapon threat, and just turned out he was a horrible route runner. Uh, things were not working out, and he he never lasted with the team. It was just you know, again, a guy with so much buzz that everybody was seeing there. You know, it was very much like a guy that I'm going to mention next, and next, and that's Danny Gray. That you know is acting like that. There's this massive offensive weapon that's sitting there on the shelf not being used uh the the conversation around jason hill was almost identical to danny gray uh that here's this big time speed guy drafted in the third round wide receiver why is he not seeing the field the coaches must be holding him back that was jason hill that's danny gray it's almost like seeing a repeat of history so do you remember jason hill yeah <clears throat> jason hill was the number five wide receiver on Madden and I would actually plug him in to make sure that he because was he had like fourth. 97 speed something exactly like that. and so whenever I'd have four wide receivers I would go into settings and just flip-flop away's a K or I don't know I'm just making up names I don't know who was the the guy that I switched out but I did put Jason Hill in just based on speed and so yes I do remember that name but I remember also just only in Madden, not in real life. Yeah. yeah. Then so another guy who was a letdown for me was Reggie Smith. Do you remember him? He was a he was a defensive back brought in to be, yeah, brought in to be kind of safety nickel hybrid. Mm. Um, you know, essentially he was did Jimmy he play Ward Buffalo? before Jimmy Ward. Did he ever make yeah. it and play in Buffalo? I believe he went he he did a little bit. Um, but I, I just remember know. them drafting him. And again, it was that Mike Nolan era that Reggie yeah. Smith um where it was uh, was was supposed to be what Jimmy Ward was, and uh, that he could play a bunch of different positions, really athletic, all this sort of stuff was supposed to be a safe a guy to come in and and be a difference maker on defense. What they really needed in the back end, and uh, and this multi tool guy, and just never worked out. It it he he every time he was in, it was like teams went after him, and it just didn't work out, and it was like he didn't really ever latch on to the game. So uh, I had Reggie Smith in there again, another one of those guys from the late two thousands uh, that, that just didn't quite work out. I get once you're, we're getting a little, once it's like, and you mentioned this like third round. Okay. If they don't pan out, I, like not too many people are losing their job over. So it's like, these guys have to have some sort of story that goes along with it, which you're doing a good job of, of explaining. But sometimes I'm like, well, okay, it's fair that he didn't work out. But unless they, were, you know what I mean? Like a third yeah. round isn't. And, and that's why I say letdowns because these, these yeah. were guys I remember there being buzz about and being, you know, and especially at, at that point in the draft, the foreigners were picking really high in the third round. Yeah. And, you know, again, we've seen valuing of some of these slot and safety guys that that that's a high end pick for that, that kind of right. era area. So there's that. Another guy I think was a, was a big letdown. Uh, and this is hard because I know his godfather. 
Um, he, and he's from the state of Alabama and he played at the University of Alabama and he was drafted by the 49ers and then promptly retired after one year. And that was Glenn Coffee. Uh, oh, so man, yeah. Yeah, so Glenn Coffee, if you remember that, yes, Glenn Coffee was the third. Dr. Steve knew it. He he heard me start saying it and he knew where we were going with there. If you remember, he came in during the Singletary era, was supposed to be the the you know, number two to Frank Gore. And a, somebody that ran like Frank Gore was very productive at Alabama and then turned around and he retired. And after after his first season and went and joined the military. And then really he actually, what most people don't know, he dropped out of that. And then he went and uh, tried to become a a military chaplain and a minister. And then he left that and he's quit a lot of things in his life. Um, So uh, because, and and I met his godfather actually at at something here and, and I was talking to the guy and he found out I was a 49ers fan. He goes, Oh boy, you're probably not going to like me too much. He said, why? He goes, uh, my godson is Glenn coffee. And I was like, Oh, How's he doing? <laughs> and and uh, he just kind of was like, oh, well, uh, yeah. And uh, and so there's that. So that Glenn Coffey really good. irritated a lot of Niner fans because, you know, he was a third round pick and then he just kind of retires, kind of like a, a Borland there. Um, but, but he didn't even have the excuse of like, I'm worried about my health sort of thing. So another third round pick, and this one was one, again, big letdown for me because of what he was supposed to be and the potential that was there but was outside linebacker had one sack with the 49ers and i was at the game that he had that one sack and that was Corey lemonier uh if you remember Corey lemonier um who was an outside linebacker he was supposed to be that other top end speed speed pass rush specialist that they could put in opposite Alden Smith and really bring some extra juice. Ahmad Brooks was meant to be the rundown guy. Corey Lemonier was going to come in and be the pass rush specialist and really bring some extra added juice opposite Alden Smith. And he had one career sack. It was, I believe it was October 2nd uh, against the Arizona Cardinals on Carson Palmer. I was there for that game. The only sack he ever had. Um, and technician, he's like, Oh, that's a name I did not expect to still be in my brain. Yeah, Corey Lemonier. Uh, if you remember him, so he's on my letdowns, uh, just absolutely did not work out. And again, what he was supposed to be in the expectations that were there. So, and do you remember Corey Lemonier? Um, is it was it spelled with an X at, on the end somewhere? No, no, at lemon, it smell, spells like lemon and then E I E R at the end. Oh, so I would think like Lenore uh, is what I would think in my head. Lemon but, ER. Uh, Lemon yeah, yeah. ear. Lemon ear. I don't know. The Lumineers are a decent band. I would I would like to see them in concert. Is there's that. Um, oh my gosh. No, I I don't I huh. And there's a reason you don't remember him because he didn't do anything. <laughs> that's why he's on the letdowns list. No, that's uh, fair. And then um, Marcus Lattimore was a fifth round pick, if I or fourth round pick, if I remember right. Marcus Lattimore, uh, Moon Man, is is put Marcus Lattimore in the, right, in right. the chat there. I believe he was a fourth round pick. Uh, Which, Corey and Lemonier. I want to ask you real quick, um, as we are kind of winding down. I do want to ask you: Are are we looking to do a once it's past the third round? Just say call them late round and do late round picks and disappointments. I mean, you could be a seventh round yeah. pick and still be a, a disappointment. I guess if there's at one point you did make the team and then all of a yeah. sudden, and if there was hype about like, well, he only dropped to the seventh round because he had surgery, but man, he's a stud. Like if there's any of those stories, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. But. I think it would be a similar thing where there's, you know, Oh, this is a first round talent or second round talent who dropped and, you know, they, they were able to get him or, you know, there was medical issues and they were able to get him yeah. and then you know he's healthy, but didn't actually have the talent. That's sort of that, that sort of thing. I'm, yeah. I'm, what, I'm, what we're going to do is we're going to do fourth and fifth round picks, and then we're going to do six, seven plus. Sure. Because call them late remember, round. yeah, you know, yeah, well, yeah, like spoiler alert, Jesse Zapolo was a 12th round pick. 
<laughs> because he was at a time when there was a lot of rounds of the draft. So, you know, I can't just do seventh round and then forget all the guys who were drafted, you know, like a Jesse Sapolo. When we can't forget Jesse Sapolo either. He'll never no, come back on the show. Absolutely for not. Him, so. Never. He would, he would, he, and I would have you to blame. So, um, but anyways, my last letdown, my last letdown, I want to get to this guy because, uh, People for, will will forget about this, and you hear this name, and you're going to be like, "Oh wow, yeah, I I, I remember that." Guy. Brandon Thomas. Do you mm. remember Brandon Thomas? Guard was brought in. Was supposed to be. He was supposed to be a guy who was going to be a a, uh, a. He was brought in to really take over for uh, uh, David Boss and Justin Smiley, who were there. And he was supposed to be a, a good player. I, I, actually, I'm confusing the years. He was brought in later. He was, it was at the end of the Mike Nolan era. But he was he was brought in to help be that, you know, bolster that run game with Frank Gore and uh, and really boost the team and absolutely fell, fell short. I will also say another guy on the letdowns that very similar, Chilo Rashal. Uh, if you uh, remember Chilo Rashal, yes. he, yeah. he So he, if you remember, Rashal was, was a kid – who he came out early in the draft. He 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 was a junior and he came out early in the draft. It was projected if he had stayed and played his senior year that he may have come out of the draft and been a first rounder hmm. because the talent was there. But he came out because his mom, I believe if I remember right, she had to have surgery and she was really needing some money. And so he left college early to go to the NFL and get some money to pay for his mom to have surgery. And he was called the, and, and Larry Allen had reti was retiring. And so he was called the poor man's Larry Allen because he mm -hmm. was really a really, really powerful run blocker. Chilo Rashal ended up being absolute garbage. I will always remember that the, the five and a half sack game that Alden Smith had against the Bears, if you remember that. You know, that game that it was like every time the Bears dropped back to pass, Alden Smith was getting a sack. He had like three of those on Chilo Rashal. So, uh, and Brandon Thomas and Chilo Rashal, very, very similar players. Um, there was expectations for them. Again, guards, this was especially at a time when guards were never taken in the first round, rarely taken in the second round. So if you were a, like a high third round pick as a guard, that meant you were supposed to be one of the best guards coming out of the out of college. And uh, Brandon Thomas was one of those guys. Chilo Rashal was one of those guys that they were supposed to be one of the best guards out of that class, out of their class. And they both were absolute cheeks. Um, <laughs> cheeks. And uh, and I mean, just again, just just go watch the highlights of Alden Smith's <laughs> Five sack game against the Bears, and you will see Chyla Rashal being put on his cheeks multiple times. <laughs> um, and then you re you realize why the 49ers let him go. And and he was and both of those guys failing is why they drafted Mike Upati. And then they ended up putting uh Adam Snyder converting him to guard because both those guys didn't work out. So uh yeah. Uh, so moon man, we talked about Mike Rumpf. Uh, he was a first round pick. So back in our, on our first round picks video, we yeah, talked about Mike back. Rumpf being a, a first round pick bust. I believe he was sec 22nd overall was what he was picked. If I remember right, if the, if the noggin still works, uh, the way it used to, I remember, I remember that that was the draft. If you remember when Mike Rumpf was picked that like seven guys from university of Miami were picked in the first round. It yeah. was, it was wild. Um, so like just just like every other pick in that draft was uh was a was a University of Miami, Miami player. I believe it was it was actually the 2005 draft um that that happened 2004 or 2005. Uh like Jeremy I remember Shockey and guys like that. I yeah, think, right? yeah. Well, Shockey was drafted earlier. Shockey was in the league in 2001, 2002. Oh. Um but Mike Rumpf was Kellen Winslow was in then. that yeah, yeah. There were there was a I mean there was, there was seven ton. first rounders from the University of Miami. It was yeah. wild. Uh there was just a run on safeties. players from there. Yeah. And and that also then was why like a guy like Mike Rumpf didn't work out because he was playing on such a good team. And so he was not actually as talented as as everybody thought because he was yeah. surrounded by such good players. <laughs> and uh 
but yeah, uh, so so those are my letdowns. The last two were going to be Brandon Thomas and Shiloh Rashal, uh, as guys that were just letdowns for me out of the third round. Um, so yeah, how you feel? How you feel about the show, Adam? You know, some of these bring back names. I, I I'm still not. I, I don't know. I, I I still can't agree with you there on leaving Bob St. Clair and David Wilcox off your list. I just can't come to terms with that. Two legends of the 49ers hall of fame players. Both of them are in the hall of fame. Dave Wilcox in 2000, Bob St. Clair in 1990, but agree to disagree. Right. Right. And I don't disagree with having them on for sure. I just went a different way with what they mean to the team and that, and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, this, this has been, this has been awesome. Remember, to to go back and if if you're liking the the talks about the our draft picks to go back and check out the other the other shows that we've done and we will continue on Monday talking about our draft picks and looking ahead to the draft if there's any uh, breaking news uh, from now until the weekend and on Monday the 49ers we, we did go over sign, that. A, sign a corner they they did sign a corner. Oh, uh, I did see that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's a depth piece. Yeah, I don't see him as as a guy that they're looking to have as a starter. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, they did sign a guy. Um, again, not a big needle move to me. You here's know, a guy looking at it. Here's yeah. a guy. Here's a guy. <laughs> so if so. anything else happens, though, we'll you know we'll we'll break it down. But yes, we'll get into more draft picks uh, on the 49ers. But until then. Be sure to stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, go Niners.